Shiro hallelujah, Shiro hallelujah, Shiro hallelujah, 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 Shiro hallelujah, Shiro hallelujah, Shiro hallelujah.
have this one is live, and the other two are not.
finished and Sherry's not here. She's the next speaker. She speaks and then you speak. I speak and she speaks, then you speak. She's coming. Good evening. Good evening. I would like to welcome all of you who have joined us in the sanctuary and all of you who have tuned in via the virtual universe. I'm delighted to have you join us for what I know will be a challenging inspirational presentation and discussion. To be able to share the insights of a brilliant author and a public intellectual, such as Dara Horn with you, is indeed an honor. And it is a pleasure to be part of the launch of the Rabbi Alan B. Lucas Lecture Series, which was founded to honor Rabbi Lucas's commitment to education and personal growth for our congregants, students, and the community. Hopefully, the series will flourish and we will welcome other educators and speakers who will continue to foster our growth. Inviting Dr. Horn was actually Rabbi's idea. Of course, he doesn't necessarily know it. I don't remember if it was Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, but during his sermon, Rabbi mentioned and recommended her newest book, People Love Dead Jews. I was struck by the thought-provoking title and since I always do what my rabbi tells me, not really, I bought the book. After reading it, I realized how important it was to have everyone read it. So I immediately used it for the TBS book group. When we were brainstorming about having an event that reflected Rabbi Lucas's passion for intellectual growth, the concept of this lecture series was born. Once it was agreed upon, we decided to invite an author that Rabbi Lucas endorsed from the Bema, and one whose latest book, unfortunately, reflected the current state of anti-Semitism from an interesting and historical perspective. We were fortunate in being able to have Dr. Horn come onto Long Island via the Long Island Railroad, and we are very proud of her for doing that and being here this evening. Rabbi. I bet you didn't realize how closely the things you say from this bima are followed. While I am pleased to be able to bring Dr. Horn to our community, I also find this event to be a bit sad. This lecture seri series was conceived to honor the educator, the master teacher, and the spiritual leader that Rabbi Lucas has been at Temple Beth Shalom for these last 28 years. It was launched as one of the Rabbi Alan B. Lucas farewell events. Several weeks ago, Rabbi Lucas mentioned that my family had the privilege to host him and Evie for their audition weekend. I do remember that weekend very vividly and fondly. We talked, we laughed, and our families began a relationship. Our kids became friends. Life has taken us down many roads, some straight, and some with bumps, and some with very sharp curves. Along with the other members of our congregation, we watch their children grow, get married, have babies of their own. Together we shared in joy and in grief. Personally, I have laughed and cried with, agreed with and disagreed with, learned from and found spiritual comfort in that person that I met 28 years ago. And now I am bold enough to call him my friend. Whoever came up with the Hebrew language was smart enough to utilize the same word for hello and goodbye. Shalom. So tonight, we welcome you to the Rabbi Alan B. Lucas Lecture Series. And to me, it is part of the Rabbi Alan B. Lucas Shalom 
events. For our shalom is not a goodbye or a farewell. And as they say in the hood, Metza Hashem, we will say hello to him many, many more times in the future. With your continued support, we look forward to bringing more educational, inspiring, and innovative programs to the Rabbi Alan B. Lucas Lecture Series. It is with joy and gratitude that I welcome our congregation, both in person and remotely, our clergy and our honored guests. It has been a long two years since we were able to meet indoors in a large group such as this. On behalf of TBS Sisterhood, I would like to thank Dara Horn for her presence here today as part of Sisterhood's tribute to honor Rabbi Lucas. Her book, People Love Dead Jews, challenges us to rethink our beliefs and common misconceptions of our Jewish heritage. Rabbi Lucas has praised her book from the pulpit during the high holidays, and we have discussed her book in the Sisterhood Book Group. I am grateful that adult learning and education for personal growth is foundational to the amazing group of women who comprise TBS Sisterhood. Our educational programs are open to the entire congregation, and I encourage you to attend. It is through the dedication of the Sisterhood Board and our members, membership dues, participation in fundraiser, and program donations that we can co-sponsor this event. We are grateful to Rabbi Lucas, who could always be relied upon to present thoughtful and provocative lectures on behalf of Sisterhood. Often his lectures, which cover topics ranging from gun control to kashrut, were standing room only. As part of Sisterhood's tribute to Rabbi Lucas, we're establishing a lecture series in his honor. It is very fitting that Dara Horn is the first speaker as part of this series. Thank you. Dr. Dara Horn is the award-winning author of six books, including novels, In the Image, The World to Come, All Other Things, A Guide to the Perplexed, and Eternal Life, and an, and a, an essay collection, um, People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present. One of Granta Magazine's best young American novelists, She's the recipient of two National Jewish Book Awards, the Edward Lewis Wallant Award, the Harold U. Riblau Award, and the Reform Judaism Fiction Prize. And she was a finalist for the Wingate Prize, the Simpson Family Literary Prize, and the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Her books have been selected as New York Times notable books book lists 25 best books of the decade, and San, Francisco's, San Francisco Chronicle's best books of the year, and her books have been translated into 11 languages. Her nonfiction work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, um, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Smithsonian Magazine, and the Jewish Review of Books, among many other publications and she's a regular columnist for Tablet Magazine. Dr. Horn received her doctorate in comparative literature from Harvard University, studying Yiddish and Hebrew. She's taught cor courses in these subjects at Sarah Lawrence College and Yeshiva University, and held the, the Gerald Win Weinstock Visiting Pro <laughs> Let's do it again. Um, Gerald Weinstock Visiting professional prof Professorship in Jewish Studies at Harvard. 
She has lectured for audiences in hundreds of venues throughout North America, Israel, and Australia. She lives in New Jersey with her husband and four children. And it just happens, as you now know, that the senior rabbi of Congregation Ayudath Israel is our own Ari Lucas, who spent his tween and teen years right here and has now followed his father's footsteps to become a great educator and spiritual leader. It is our honor now to welcome Dr. Dara Horn as the inaugural speaker for the Alan B. Lucas Lecture Series. But if I made a, a point of personal privilege, um, uh, thank you for those very nice comments. Uh, and I think the thing that I will be taking with me most of all are the relationships uh, that were made over these, these 28 years. Uh, although I do have to admit that I was a little surprised when, when I was informed that they were establishing the Rabbi Allen B. Lucas lecture series. I thought you were gonna invite me to give a lecture. <laughs> um, but this is a great tribute and I have great respect for sisterhood uh, you know in many synagogues sisterhoods didn't develop and as a result they very quickly became irrelevant and in many shuls uh, they don't have it uh, but this congregation it developed in very significant ways into a very substantive group that does significant things and it's a source of great great pride so I'm gonna, um, I was gonna say, I'm gonna give the, um, the first word to Dara, but it's too late for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanna say thank you to Rabbi Lucas, and I'm, I'm always grateful to some Rabbi Lucas or other, so as you heard, I'm a congregant in uh, Rabbi Lucas Jr. Shul uh, in New Jersey, so I feel like I already know everyone here because I, I keep hearing about uh, my rabbi as a child, so it's very, really honored to be here, and I want to thank everyone uh, who is involved in inviting me here. I'm really, really honored to participate. Um, as you heard, I'm Dara Horn, and I am the author of a book called People Love Dead Jews, and I still can't believe that my publisher let me keep that title. Um, there, I also have a spin-off podcast uh, of this, um, the same theme as the book, but totally different stories. It's called Adventures with Dead Jews. And the production team and I are always joking about how we want to make merch, like coffee mugs, tote bags, beach towels, right? Like no one's gonna take your seat at the pool with your Adventures with Dead Jews beach towel there, right? Like you know when you get out of the water, your seat is still there. So, you know, I mean, I make these jokes because I feel like, you know, a lot of people are made very uncomfortable by this title. And of course, that's entirely intentional on my part because if you're uncomfortable with the title, you're gonna be a lot more uncomfortable with everything that's inside the book. And I, I didn't start out this way, um, sort of being this outrageous. Um, my f first five books I wrote were novels. I've been writing novels for 20 years, and all of the 20 years I spent writing these novels, all of these novels deal very deeply with uh, themes from Jewish history, Jewish texts, traditions, um, and, and as you heard, I teach Yiddish and Hebrew literature. I've taught in a variety of places, and I basically spent 20 years not writing this book. And what I mean by that is, it was always extremely important to me in all of my work to define Jewish identity from the inside. I never wanted Jewish identity to be determined by what the world did to the Jews. It was important to me to present this, this culture and civilization to my readers, to my students, to everyone who I was interacting with and, and sharing my research with as an autonomous civilization. And this is always what I was emphasizing in my books and in my work. And so much, I was so adamant about this, I, was, I, I cared so much about this, that often when I would go to speak about my books publicly, I would ask the people in the audience, how many people here can name three concentration camps? And that's something a lot of readers can do. I would then ask those same readers, how many people here can name three Yiddish writers? A whole lot less people can do that. And the reason I ask this question is because 
85% of the people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. It's a famously literary culture. And what I'm really then asking these readers is, why do we care so much about how these people died if we don't care at all about how these people lived? I now look back at that, these 20 years that I spent sort of really you know, delving into this, and I think I was a little bit naive because I think I did not appreciate at that point the profound role that dead Jews play in the wider world's imagination. And things kind of took a turn for me in the past four years or so, and that was when I started thinking of the ideas that went into this book. I don't know if you want to start a conversation or if you want me to sort of uh, continue on this. Well, we can, well, we can you know, we can, we can converse a little bit. And yeah. I, I suspect we're gonna give you the opportunity uh, and you can certainly fill it in, fill it in at the end. Yes. Y you, all, you already, you know, touched on, on, uh, on, on the first question, you know, the, the idea that this book has made quite a, uh, a splash. Uh, both in, in the contemporary literary uh, scene and the popular scene. Um, and, and I sort of wanted to focus first about this, the difference between this book and, and, and your other books. Um, and to be honest, as much as I liked it, uh, if one can use the word liked, <laughs> right. you know, uh, about uh, the challenge that you confront us with, I have to be honest, I like your other books even more. All right? and, and Me too. All right, well, so that was I'm going to ask you, which are, which are you more comfortable with? Uh, Dara Horn, the author of A Guide for the Perplexed, All Other Nights, The World to Come, or Dara Horn, the author of People Love Dead Jews? Dara Horn, the fiction writer, or Dara Horn, the nonfiction writer? Well, way more comfortable with Dara Horn, the novelist, um, but the, that's your choice of words of which are you more comfortable with kind of goes to the heart of this problem because... This book is all about being uncomfortable. And I mean, this sort of brings me to the point of where I, how I decided to write this book to begin with. And like, I, I still kind of can't believe that I'm the person who wrote this book. Um, that's how much I wanted to avoid writing this book after spending 20 years not writing this book. The way this happened was in 2018, Smithsonian Magazine approached me and asked me to write an essay for them about Anne Frank. And I got this request, and I felt overwhelmed with dread. Because I thought, wow, I really don't want to write an essay about Anne Frank for Smithsonian Magazine, or for that matter, for anyone. And the thing is that the, the normal response to this would be to turn this assignment down. But I'm a writer. I'm not a normal person, right? Like, nothing, none of the choices I make are normal. And I just sort of thought, you know, this is interesting. Why don't I want to do this? And to your point about being uncomfortable, one thing that I have learned in 20 years of being a writer is that the uncomfortable moments are actually where the story is, because that's when you're about to learn something that you were avoiding. And I thought, you know, like, why don't I want to do this? Like, why do I feel so sick to my stomach thinking about this topic? And that was when, and, and I knew it wasn't about, like, oh, the Holocaust is really sad, and I don't want to write about this because of, you know, the horrors of the Holocaust. Like, that wasn't why. And I knew there was some other reason why. And I was trying to think, like, why don't I want to do this? And that was when I remembered this ridiculous news item that I had read about something that had happened at the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam in 2018. Um, and I love that I don't now have to spend five minutes explaining what the Anne Frank Museum is. Yay. Um, everyone here knows what that is. In 2018, there was a young Jewish man working at that museum. And the museum would not allow him to wear his yarmulke to work they made him hide it under a baseball hat. And he appealed this decision to the board of the museum. The board of the museum then deliberated for four months and then finally relented and let this young man wear his yarmulke to work. And, you know, I had read that news story and I just thought, you know, four months is a very long time for the Anne Frank Museum to ponder whether or not it was a good idea to force a Jew into hiding. And, you know, I just was remembering this story, and I thought, like, you know, did I dream this? Did this really happen? So I, like, type it into Google, and I'm looking it up, and then I discovered not only did, yes, it did happen, something equally ridiculous had happened a few months earlier at the same museum where visitors had noticed something weird about the audio guides. It's a big international museum. They have maybe 15 languages for their audio guide, and, you know, it says English, and there's a little British flag, and it says Francais, and there's a little French flag, until you get to Hebrew. 
Hebrew, no flag. No flag. And I thought, you know, these are PR mishaps, but they're not mistakes. And then I decided to write this piece for Smithsonian, but to write it about this problem. And that was the opening line for my piece for Smithsonian was, people love dead Jews, living Jews, not so much. And what happened at that point was I kind of was like, okay, I've gotten this idea out of my system. You know, I published this in this, you know, mainstream magazine, which, you know, was a lot of non-Jewish readers, and I got that out there. But what happened was that came out in one of their fall 2018 issues, and it was only a few days after that piece came out that there was the shooting at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. And it was like within hours of that attack that the New York Times calls me, and they're like, you know, would you like to write about dead Jews again? Um, they didn't say it that way, but that was what they meant. And, you know, at that point, I kind of was like, no, I don't. But again, then I, and in, th in that case, I kind of felt the sense of obligation because I thought, just kind of thought like, someone has to say yes to this assignment in the next 24 hours. <laughs> and if I don't say yes, like, who are they going to choose instead of me? Like, maybe I'm protecting the public from a bozo. And, you know, so I said yes to this. And then, but then it happens again. And it's like, as I put it in the book, like, I became the, the New York Times' go-to person for the emerging literary genre of synagogue shooting op-eds. I was like, you know, I didn't apply for this job. And at that point, I just thought, I realized this, like, you know, this is the only thing my editors at mainstream publications wanted me to write about was dead Jews. And that was when I had this idea, you know, the uncomfortable moments are where the story is. And I just thought, I'm, I've been avoiding this for so long, I'm just going to dive into this and sort of see what I discover. And then I, you know, I mean, yeah, I would rather just be a novelist. I mean, you know, I mean, it's also kind of disturbing to me that, you know, this book has, I mean, it's like, it's nice as an author when people appreciate your work, but I have to admit, like, I kind of wish people liked this book a little bit less, because, I mean, it's, it, it, the fact that this is so resonant with people is very upsetting to me. And clearly a lot of it has to do with the, the provocative title. Yes. Everyone loves dead Jews. First question is, you sort of alluded to it, this was your idea, the title? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not the editor or anything. No, no. Oh, in fact, I think that I was expecting the editor to push back on this, yes. and they didn't. And, and it reminds me, I mean, the other thing that came to my mind when I was thinking about this is sort of uh, Harold Kushner's When Bad Things Happen to Good People. It's, mm -hmm. it's the title that sort of turned it in, well, uh, into a bestseller. It's a good book, but, but it was clearly that title that captured people um, um, uh, imagination. Um, why, though, do you think this, uh, I mean, I guess the New York Times is part of the answer, but why is this resonating so deeply with so many people right now? Well, I mean, there's horrible answers to that question. So with this book, um, you know, it's not really like a book about anti-Semitism. It's about the role that that Jews play in a wider world's imagination, which encompasses anti-Semitism. But I didn't really see it as that. And I wrote this book like as an intellectual exercise. Like I really, I wasn't writing this book about my personal life. It wasn't like, you know, here's a bunch of things that happened to me. It was more like, this is a problem that I've noticed in my work as a writer, in my work as a researcher, as an educator, you know, this is like a problem that I've just noticed repeatedly. And what's sort of disturbed me when you say sort of, you know, why is this resonant with people? I now know why. Because since this book came out, I've gotten enormous amount of responses from readers. You know, just, you know, messages and mail and things like that. And what's actually kind of most upsetting to me is the amount of mail I've gotten from Jewish readers. I've got a lot of mail from a lot of different readers, but the mail from Jewish readers is upsetting to me because these are readers from really all walks of life. They're old people, young people, religious people, secular people, people from the United States, people from around the world, and they're all writing me exactly the same message. They all write you know, I've felt uncomfortable my whole life, and I've never understood why. Your book articulated this for me. Thank you. And then they say, I never told anyone this, but. 
and then they tell me some horrible, degrading story about something that happened in their life. And then they say, thank you for writing this book. And sometimes they say, can you help? Which is very upsetting, because I'm like, no, I can't, I can't help. Um, but, you know, this, there is an enormous amount of unarticulated pain. And also, I think that the, one of the ways that we, the ways that we usually talk about Jewish history is the, 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 uh, there's so many aspects of Jewish history that are so extreme that I think a lot of Jews don't like acknowledge what they've been through as being, being meaningful. Like all these people told me, I never, uh, you know, this, I, never, I never told anybody this, but these aren't stories for the most part about like violence. They're stories about humiliation. That's what they're talking about. And it occurred to me though that, you know, the, for most of Jewish history, most of anti-Semitism actually isn't about violence, it's about humiliation. <clears throat> I mean, and people would say things like, telling me some horrible experience of theirs, and then say, you know, like, oh, but how can I complain about this? You know, my great-grandma survived Auschwitz. And I'm like, the, like I'm like, the bar is kind of high here right, for what you consider disturbing. And I just realized there's just so much unarticulated pain in the community that like, people don't have any way to talk about. They feel they, don't, they can't talk about it. So that's been very, very upsetting to me. So I think that a lot of people recognize this problem and they've seen it in their lives and they just sort of never knew that it was a problem. And so that's sort of the, the, on the Jewish end of my readers. Then there's what's been really interesting to me and actually kind of hope, more hopeful to me is actually in responses from non-Jewish readers, um, which have really been actually quite wonderful because the most common response I've gotten from people is basically just, wow, I had no idea. Because, you know, and, and we can talk about why, but they're basically, wow, I had no idea. Like, you know, this opened my eyes, right? Thank you for teaching me this, like, how can I learn more? And there are just like a lot of people with a lot of goodwill who want to be, you know, in the today's parlance, good allies, but like, don't know how. And that's something that I've discovered through my readers. Um, and, and, and through my readers, and I mean, I've even gotten letters from people, you know, I'm a recovering anti-Semite. I found your book by accident in this public library in Wyoming. You know, thank you. <laughs> I shared it with my family. I mean, it's sort of, it's been kind of an amazing thing, but I think it's that, I think the reason it's been gotten such a huge response is because I'm talking about something that people are, like know is there, but didn't have the words for. And I recognize that because I didn't have the words for it either. Yeah, you know, I want to stay with this, the uncomfortable theme yes. for just another minute. <laughs> I mean, you described it that you went with it because you realized in your own life that, that uncomfortable is where the growth is, is where the learning takes place. Um, and, and therefore, you wrote this very uncomfortable book, it, it, I assume, to help people with their growth. Do you feel that it's, which is the greater experience in these letters that you're getting, that it's an affirmation or that there really is movement and growth? Well, so I wouldn't say I wrote it like to share this with readers because I wrote it to figure it out for myself. Because, and this is true for my fiction also, you asked about fiction versus nonfiction. I never plan any of my books. Like I don't, you know, I'm not like sitting there with an outline. And I'm also not a polemical writer. So, I mean, this book does have an argument, but it's not like, like I'm not the kind of writer who's like, you know, here's, here's what I think and here's three reasons why you should think this too. You're, like that's you're not, not a rabbi in other words. Well, no. <laughs> that's right. I guess that's right. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm a storyteller, and, and I don't plan my stories. I'm, like, kind of taking you along. I'm, like, come, come with me and figure out what's wrong with this picture. You know, come with me, and let me walk you through this, and you're going to, you as the reader are kind of helping me in a sense, to discover this. So I don't think about the audience. Like, that's what people have asked. Oh, did you write this for Jews or for non-Jews? Like, I don't think about who's reading my books. Like, and that's something I learned from my first book, because to the extent that I thought anybody was, I mean, and as I said, all my books deal with Jewish themes. To the extent that I thought anybody was going to read it other than my mom, I was kind of like, this is a book for Jewish readers. But um, the editor, my editor, who's, I've actually had the same editor at my publishing house for all of my books, She's not Jewish. 
And I remember the very first time that I ever spoke to her when she was, you know, we were negotiating a contract for the first book, and she asked me, I asked her what her background was, and what I meant by that question was, what's your background in publishing? Like, how long have you been with this publisher? Do you mostly deal with fiction or nonfiction? I'll remember this the rest of my life. She just paused on the phone, and she's like, well, I'm Italian-American. I'm a lapsed Roman Catholic. And I'm, like, so embarrassed that this woman thinks this is what I asked her. I don't even know this woman. And she says, I felt like I was reading about my own life and my own family. So, you know, so I, I, I now, like, put this away. Like, I never think about the reader at all. Like, I'm just, it's just, I realize, like, it's meaningless. But, or it's meaningless for me to try to anticipate what readers will find. But in terms of, like, you know, is it an affirmation or is it growth? I mean, I think it's both. Um, I think for some readers who are totally unfamiliar with this, that's, um, you know, then it really is just learning something. But I think that, um, I mean, I'm dealing with a lot of unfamiliar topics in this book. Um, you know, we, I talked about the Anne Frank example, which is the opening chapter, but like, in every chapter of this book, I really am introducing people to stories that they're unlikely to know. Um, I mean, even in the Anne Frank chapter, half of that chapter is about Anne Frank, and the other half is about uh, another writer, Zalman Grudowski, who most <laughs> readers probably never heard of until they read it in this book. Um, so, I mean, I am sort of bringing you into a different world where you probably, I mean, I think most people are going to learn something from this book or going to encounter a different, you know, perspective that they didn't have before. So, at least when you were talking to your, your publisher, you didn't say, when you asked for her background, you didn't say, uh, on, a, on a scale of one to ten, you know, are you a religious person, you know, how did you do? <laughs> but um, this idea that, you know, they, there's a cliche in writing that write about what you know, uh, but your novels, you can't possibly know about these things, <laughs> you know, they're very stra strange subjects. What, what, so clearly you don't buy that cliche. Yeah, no, I, I write about what other people know. It's like, I, I'm not so interested in what I know, like that's boring to me. Um, yeah, I mean, and, but that's true of this book too. So all of my, I mean, that's one, another thing that was, you know, I mean, it wasn't such a big shift for me to go from fiction to nonfiction in that, I mean, obviously there's nothing in this book that I made up and my novels, I, yes, I make stuff up, but all of my novels deal with, are very research driven. I mean, I have a lot of, they're often historical. They, I have actual historical figures who I put as characters in the book. So yeah, I'm never really, I, I mean, what the hardest part about this book actually was the parts where I had to write about myself because I'm, I'm just not a very public person. Like, I, like I don't even really have social media accounts. Like I don't, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I, I don't like sharing a lot of things about myself and that felt the weirdest was to put myself into the book. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I don't really write about what I know. I'm, I mean, I went to China to, learn things. <laughs> Which, by the way, the chapter, I, I, I mean, as a fairly knowledgeable Jew, I had never heard of Harvard. And, and, and what, an, what an incredible, you know, story that was. I was amazed not only about the story that you told, but the fact that I'd never heard of it, I, neither the city nor the story. Um, I, I want to talk to you about these, your, your concepts on the Jewish heritage sites. Yes. Right, it reminds me of the, uh, the Stolperstein, the, the stumbling yes. stones in, in Berlin uh, outside the formerly Jewish homes. Um, is something better than nothing? Uh, and isn't it a good thing that, you know, at least they're preserving these sites? Yes, so, um, there's, so for people who haven't read the book, and there's a chapter in the book about a city in China called Harbin. It's a... Uh, it's in northeastern China. It's south of Siberia, north of North Korea, which and is... How many million people live there? Oh, thir uh, I think it's a 16 million. Yeah, like it's... Yeah, they're like... Haven't, oh, haven't heard of it. Yeah, right. well, I mean, like every... And New York's yeah. only, what, 10 million, Yes, right? right. I mean, like, like many, yes, like many Chinese cities you haven't heard of. It's larger than New York. Um, you know, in China, that's not saying much. <laughs> um, but yeah, but the thing that's uh, about this city is that it was essentially built by Jews. Um, this was, I mean, it's a long story, we don't have to take a lot of time here, but, um, you know, the, the, in 1896, the Russians got a, a concession from the Chinese to build, like, a branch line and a Trans-Siberian Railroad into China. They had to build an administrative center for this railroad. They basically needed to build a town. They needed Russian-speaking entrepreneurs to build this town for them. The problem is, like, who the heck wants to move to Manchuria? So they're like, oh, hello, Jews. 
Would you like to live without anti-Semitic restrictions, but not have to be a bottom feeder in a New York City sweatshop? Oh, we have an option for you. You can move to Manchuria. So yeah, 20,000 Russian Jews went and built this whole city. Um, you know, I, I, you don't even, I don't even have to tell you that this story ends badly. Um, you know, like all Jewish history, um, you know, I'm not even going to go into the details. The last Jewish families evacuated by the Israeli government in 1962. Um, today, a lot, and this, I, I don't say this in the book, but I can say it here. This place is so, so remote that they don't even have a Chabad. <laughs> There's one Jew in this town. There's one Jew in this town, but no Chabad. So that tells you something. After your speaking tour, there probably will be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So very possible, very possible. So yeah, no Chabad, one Jew, and the the reason I I went there was because with one Jew and the the government in this province of China decided to spend thirty million dollars restoring Jewish heritage sites in Harbin with one Jew. So to go to this question about Jewish heritage sites. A lot of us have heard this term before. This is a very popular concept in a lot of places around the world that used to have a lot of Jews and don't have so many anymore. And as I put it in the book, this term Jewish heritage sites, it's like a brilliant marketing term because it sounds so much better than property seized from dead or expelled Jews, right? Like, who wants to go to that, right? Wouldn't you rather go to a Jewish heritage site? Like, it sounds so benign. And what's amazing about this place in Harbin, this city, is that they say the quiet part out loud. And what I mean by that is the mayor of Harbin um, well, I should start by saying, you know, at one point when they're planning this, you know, major funding for these Jewish heritage sites, they held a conference called International Forum on Economic Cooperation Between Harbin and the World's Jews. Yeah, I couldn't make this up. And then the mayor of Harbin gives a speech about how much they admire the many, many impressive Jews of the past, like J.P. Morgan and Nelson Rockefeller. In case you were wondering, neither of those people were yeah, Jewish. My favorite Jews, right? Yeah, yeah, my favorite Jews, J.P. Morgan. And I mean, but you're, you get the idea here. And in case it wasn't clear, he continued it, and in his speech to s explain how the money of the world is in the pockets of the Jews. And this is the greatest sign of Jewish wisdom. They basically explicitly said, Jews have money, and we would like some. And if we invest in restoring these Jewish heritage sites, you know, J Jews will come and bring their magic Jewish money to Harbin. So, I mean, I fell for this. I went there. Um, I mean, I can tell you more about it, but to, ask, to answer your question earlier, well, so one of the things I saw in Harbin, I went to one of this Jewish museum. I'm just going to give you one little example of something in this Jewish museum, which was life-size plaster people. So there's like a life-size plaster sculpture of a man sitting at a desk with a typewriter on it. And there's a caption that says, real Jewish businessman in Harbin. <laughs> and then you go to the next room, and there's two life-size plaster children playing with blocks. And it says, real Jewish children in Harbin. But they weren't real. No. Well, that's, yes. Well, so then I, like, I was, you know, I, I, I was with the Chinese guide, and I asked the guide, I was like, I'm kind of, like, confused by the word real. I'm like, is this supposed to be a particular person? And he, like, reads the Chinese caption and is like, it's a Jew in Harbin. He's doing business. I'm like, well, of course he is. <laughs> right? What else would he be doing? And, yeah, I mean, literally, you walk down the street in this historic section of the town, and there are, like, plaques on the side of the buildings, and the plaque will say, this mansion was built by a rich Jew. Like, they're not subtle. And, you know, and so to answer your question, you're, and the problem is, like, you know, you go to these places, and I've been to places like this in many parts of the world, and, and probably quite a few of you have as well, and, I mean, Europe and in many other places. And to your question, like, you know, isn't it better than nothing? Well, so I was presented, there was a person who asked me that question about someone else who had been to Harbin who said, you know, yes, it's kitschy, and, you know, it's like, you know, it's a little, stu you know, they're little, yes, they love the rich Jews. They're like, but isn't it better than nothing? Aren't you glad that, like, you know, they're honoring Jewish heritage in Harbin? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Would you say to Native Americans, 
look how we're honoring your heritage. We made these cigar store Indians for you. And look, we, we named our sports team after you. Look, we have the Braves. Like, no, of course not, right? You'd be like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, you know, you can ask, like, this, this is insulting. So I said, like, no, like, like and I, there was some mentality there where it's like you're used to accepting crumbs. And you're like, oh, it's so nice someone did something. And so I want to be really clear, like, I'm not saying that these Jewish, like, historical places should be, like, left to seed. There are better and worse ways of doing this. There are places where, you know, there, and there are places, there are Jewish heritage sites, to use that term, where they're, you know, preserved by very sincere, very learned people who are, you know, really care about this history. I wish that were the norm. But like, but I, and, and this is something I don't say in the book, but I did, I, I wrote a piece for the New York Times a few months ago about the last Jew of Afghanistan, where I talk about this phenomenon of places that don't have Jews anymore, but have Jewish heritage sites. And what I said is that I, every time I go to these places, I feel extremely uncomfortable. And probably a lot of you have felt this way too. And that when feeling uncomfortable in those places, everywhere from like, yeah, Spain to China, I mean, these places unfortunately are everywhere, I, I didn't even myself know what that feeling was. I told myself that, oh, it must be, you know, I'm feeling sad, because, oh, it's so sad that this community isn't here anymore. And it's only now that I realize that it wasn't sorrow, it was rage. Because what you're looking at in these places is the triumph of evil. And, you know, yeah, for sure in places where it's like, yeah, the Jews aren't here anymore because we murdered them all. Okay, yeah. But even in places where that's not the case, even if it's merely, merely that we drove all the Jews out and s stole all their assets, right? Like, okay. I'm like, that's the good version of this story. Like, yay, they didn't murder all the Jews. They just expelled them all and seized all their property. Like, in either case, you're looking at, like, what you're really, what they're commemorating here is the triumph of evil. Right? Because this is a society that decided that, you know, we don't want to live with people who aren't just like us. Uh, you know, it reminds <laughs> me, I, I led a youth tour to uh, Poland once when we were at Auschwitz, and there was one young girl who was, at the end of the tour, was sort of writing a note, she, and I said that, she said, I'm writing my grandmother, who's an uh, uh, Auschwitz survivor, and, and I just sort of had this bizarre kind of image, you know, grandma, I, you know, I'm, I'm here at Auschwitz, you know, right by the gift shop, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you remember that is, right. Anyway. Um, but uh, I was also fascinated by your chapter on the myth of Ellis Island, mm. right? And, and that this myth you suggested serves a purpose of covering anti-Semitism. Why, why have we Jews been so eager to embrace this myth? Yes, yeah, so this is a chapter in the book called Legends of Dead Jews, and it's about what I refer to as the myth of Ellis Island. This is the story that many of, uh, of us have heard in our families that my, my, my family's last name used to be something that sounded super Jewish, and then there was this bumbling clerk at Ellis Island who wrote down my great-grandfather's name wrong, and now our name is something that sounds super not Jewish. Like, what a funny story. Spoiler alert, it never happened. No one at Ellis Island ever wrote down in anyone's names. They had ships manifests. They were never writing down people's names. And the reality is that we also have tens of thousands of court records from New York City civil court from after a generation really after Ellis Island closed. These are records from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s of Jewish immigrants going to court to change their own names. So, so um, there's a historian, Kirsten Vermeglick, who wrote a book that came out a few years ago with another great title. Her book is called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name. And she tracks these court filings. Like she went and you know, sat in the archives in, this, in the New York City court and reads through all these court filings. And there's a few things she finds in those court filings. First of all, you know, did other ethnic groups change their names? Yeah, but what she finds is the overwhelming majority of names that were changed in New York City court are Jewish sounding names. She says like, I'm sitting there in the archive and it's just like pages and pages and pages and pages of Cohen's. 
And the other thing she says is that, you know, we have this idea that people who changed their names were like self-hating Jews or they were like running away from their Jewish identity. And she like tracks a lot of these people and she says that's actually not true. A lot of these people were, they continued participating in Jewish life. She said, you know, they would, they were members of synagogues and then they would change their name in court, go back to the shul and be like, I'm going to pay my membership dues under this new name now. So like, these weren't people who were running away from Jewish life. So the question is like, why were they changing their names? They were staring down a reality that they could not avoid, and that reality was American anti-Semitism. And you know, so today we talk about anti-Semitic incidents, but like in 1940, it wasn't about incidents. It was like, you couldn't get a job. You know, you couldn't stay in a hotel, right? You know, you couldn't get into college, right? I mean, your kid's being beat up at school. I mean, this is like a pervasive, life-limiting thing. And, you know, so what she, you know, what, what's interesting to me is that when I talk about this, this Ellis Island story being a myth, people get very angry at me. I get, you know, every time I talk about this, people yell at me afterwards and they say, you know, well, maybe that's true for most people, but my great-grandfather was the exception. I'm like, no, he was not the exception. <laughs> They're like, he wouldn't lie. I'm like, he lied. Um, you know, and, and, but, but what's interesting to me about this is that these are like educated people who would not, you know, accept like this kind of nonsense about anything else, right? And the, why are they so attached to this story? This story is doing emotional work for people. And that, the emotional work it's doing is burying this reality of, of American anti-Semitism. Because that story was created by that generation of American Jews to protect their descendants from psychological damage. Right? I mean, I sort of see that story as almost like a gift to subsequent generations of American Jews. But I think it goes to that sort of idea that like, you know, we sort of joke like, oh, Jews love to talk about anti-Semitism. It's really not true. Jews like to talk about anti-Semitism that comes from people who don't vote like them. That's true. But otherwise, like, these sort of humiliating experiences, people don't like to talk about that. I've discovered that through my readers. And that was very familiar. That's what, you know, what's the most amazing thing when, in Kirsten for Meglick's book, where she goes through all the court filings, what she finds is the people who are changing their name in court, they had to, in their petition, they had to give the reason they were changing their name. And they're also lying. Because every single person, they never say that it's because of anti-Semitism. Instead, they say, my name is difficult to pronounce. It's like, is there really more than one way to pronounce Lefkowitz? You know, they're like, my name is foreign sounding and makes it difficult to obtain employment. And it's like, well, there were a lot of foreign sounding names circulating in America at that time. Like, I don't know, Eisenhower, LaGuardia, LaGuardia, I'm sorry, LaGuardia, DiMaggio, Vanderbilt, Juilliard. Um, I mean, you know, these names are difficult to pronounce and spell. They sound foreign, you know, Lindbergh. I mean, you know, these are not like Roosevelt, very hard to spell. You know, I mean, why are we pretending that this is about spelling or foreign sounding? Like, these are euphemisms. They're already burying the reality. They don't, they won't admit it to themselves because I think that the problem is if they admitted it to themselves, it would sort of make them look like fools because then it's like these are people whose parents, you know, uprooted their whole lives to come here from Europe because this was supposed to be different. And then they would be kind of admitting maybe it's not that different. And that was too terrifying. So, I mean, I think that there's just like a lot of buried fear. Asked, the question asked by Rabbi Lucas, whose uh, great-grandfather was Lukashevsky back in the Ukraine, right? <laughs> I, I had a friend in high school, Stu Armstrong, who insisted that the name came when his, when his grandfather got off the boat and they asked the name and since he couldn't understand the question he was being asked, he went, he wanted work. And the guy says, no, your name. You know, so he put down Armstrong. Right, but, it's a cute story. Yes. And it's not true. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Stu's no longer with us so I can't tell him that, but anyway. <laughs> Um, you speak in your book about two types of anti-Semitism, Purim and Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me very much, Eli Wiesel, Zichronel Avracha, used to teach um, that the difference between uh, the reactions in Purim and Hanukkah by Jews are very, very different. 
and that he says it was based on the idea that that we are in a we made a deal with God. We're in a covenant with God, and God said, "Look, you protect my presence here on earth." my spiritual presence, and I'll protect your physical presence. So in Purim, when it was the physical threat to the Jewish people, that's God's part of the deal. So the Jews basically just sat and prayed and hoped that he would keep up his end of the bargain. Hanukkah, they, they weren't trying to kill Jews. They just wanted to get rid of Judaism, right? So that's their part of the deal. So they had to take arms. Does this relate to the, the concept of the Hanukkah and, and Purim anti-Semitism, or, or is, is yours is very different? No, very much so, exactly. So what the way I describe it is Purim anti-Semitism is this unambiguous thing where it's like big bad guy wants to kill all the Jews, right? There's, no, there's nothing to talk about, right? It's very obvious. But what's interesting to me in the Hanukkah story is there's no moment in the Hanukkah story where anyone is, wants to kill all the Jews. Like, that doesn't even come up, right? Instead, their goal is to destroy Jewish civilization, Right? By like, it's like, we love Jews. We just, like, there's, here's like XYZ things that aren't cool about Judaism and just get rid of those. So this is like this process of a non Jewish civilization editing how Jews are allowed to be Jewish. And this kind of anti Semitism requires Jews to participate in their own humiliation. And in a sense, it requires Jews to be its agents. Um, the story I tell in the book is about um, the story of. Uh, Jews in Ju uh, um, Jews in Judea during the uh, you know during the Hellenistic regime that took over Judea. This is before you have these anti-Semitic decrees from Antiochus. Prior to that, the Jews of Judea were like, "Oh, we can be a good vassal state, right?" Like they they built a gymnasium, and they recruited teenage Jewish boys to be athletes in their gymnasium. If you've ever been to an art museum, you're aware that Greek athletics were played in the nude. These teenage Jewish boys had their circumcisions reversed so that they could participate in these games. I don't even want to know medically how that's even possible, but like especially, you know, before anesthetic. But I mean, what's interesting to me about that is that nobody was making them do that at that point. That was just what you had to do to be a person who mattered. And that sort of pattern, right, of like, there's this external society that is determining like how Jewish you can be is a pattern that recurs throughout Jewish history, I think more frequently than the Purim pattern. Um, another example I give is from the Soviet Union. And, and this, this is something that I often talk about when I speak on college campuses because it's the, it's um, in the early 1920s, the Bolsheviks created what was, they were trying to get the masses of Jews in the former Russian Empire like on their side. And so they created what were called Jewish sections of the Communist Party, Evsexia, whose job was to like disseminate you know, Marxist propaganda among the Jewish masses, as to use the lingo. And the way they did this was they had, a, they had sort of an operating slogan, which was, we are not anti-Semitic, we are just anti-Zionist. By the way, this is like 25 years before the creation of the State of Israel. So, oh, and by the way, also, we're, we're not anti-Semitic. We're just also, we're anti-religious. So, I mean, like, you know, you see that there's, basically, there's, you know, we love Jews. We just hate Zionism and Judaism. Okay, so, but otherwise, we love Jews. Everything about Judaism is awesome, except for, you know, Zionism, Judaism, except learning for everything Hebrew, about except Judaism. for everything about Judaism, exactly. So, I mean, you see the problem here. I mean, in the process of not being anti-Semitic and just being anti-Zionist, they managed to persecute, tor torture, murder, you know, and imprison like tens of thousands of Jews. They then export this slogan to their client states in the developing world, um, in the Arab world, of course, in Latin America. This is how it kind of like worms its way back to like college campuses in North America. So, and then I say to these college students, I'm like, and this is where you got this idea. It came all the way around from 100 years ago from the Bolsheviks. But what's interesting to me about this is that, like, it requires Jews to erase themselves, right, in order to be acceptable, right? It's exactly the same as that guy having to hide his yarmulke under a baseball hat. It's the same as, like, erasing the Israeli flag from the audio guide, right? Or changing your name. Yeah, or changing your name, right? I mean, and, and that's an accommodation a strategy that Jews in many communities have done to sort of make themselves acceptable. 
And you know, that's something that, so that's what I call Hanukkah anti-Semitism. It's, it's this Jewish self-erasure. So the, the, the book sort of is, has, it sort of turns on two ideas. One is that people tell stories about dead Jews that make them feel better about themselves. But then the other idea is that, you know, Jew, living Jews have to erase themselves in order to gain public respect. Um, Holocaust museums, for or against? Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember the, the controversy uh, of the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, when it was first being established, and there was this whole debate over whether it could just be a museum to the Holocaust or had to be, which I think it eventually became, a Holocaust and genocide um, museum, where there was a recognition that this was not some kind of unique. There was also, I think, uh, in your book, you speak about um, an Auschwitz show in New York yes. uh, in 2019, where the ending, the theme of it was all you need is love. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All you need is love. Right. Okay then. Yeah. So I mean, for or against? Okay. There's there's a, a lot of things to unpack here. So, you know, I think that if you look at the history of this in this country, um, it's a, about 30 or 40 years ago when this becomes like kind of a communal priority for the Jewish community here. This is at a time when you know Holocaust survivors are aging, and there was this idea. I mean, because a lot of these um, museum, you know, the museum in Washington for sure, and also not just the museum, but also it's around. So the, that museum opens in 1993. There's also um, around the same time you start having like state mandatory state curriculum that you know they have to teach the Holocaust in schools. Um, a lot of these initiatives, like the museum and, and a lot of these state curricula, were promoted by you know by the Jewish community and by you know by their either Jewish philanthropists or nonprofit groups. And the goal of those projects was to inoculate the public against anti-Semitism, right? By I mean, this was the idea was that how you know people would come to this museum or, or learn this in school, they'd learn what the world had done to the Jews, they'd see where hatred could lead, and they would then stop hating Jews. And I sort of you know, think. It, it wasn't a ridiculous idea, but you know, 30 years later, I mean, it's interesting to me that you know levels of anti-Semitism now are much higher than they were in 1993. And number one, and number two, like you know, when you're being trolled by anti-Semites on social media and they're like photoshopping your face into a gas chamber, the problem isn't that that person doesn't know about the Holocaust. That person knows about the Holocaust. So, you know, and, and now I think there's also, there's been this shift in recent years where now a lot of this memorialization is being done by non-Jews. The show that you mentioned, um, and I don't know if people were familiar with this, it was in Battery Park uh, before the pandemic in the Museum of Jewish Heritage, but it wasn't their show. Um, it was, this was a, a museum show called Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. Yes, they used a Star Wars reference for their Holocaust exhibit, and it was like on bus ads all over New York City. Um, that show was created by a for-profit European company whose business is blockbuster museum shows. Um, their biggest show that you know that you might be familiar with it was you know in New York about 15 years ago was the a show called Human Bodies. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do people remember this? This like it was like literally cadavers, which by the way they had sourced from the Chinese government. I mean it was very prisoners. They were prisoners. Yeah. Chinese. Right. I mean it was like really disturbing. And you know they they had like you know they were cross sectioned with like dyes and you know they were like posed and I mean this was a international success. This show it was like all in cities all over the world. This company has another very popular show about the Titanic. Um, as I put it in my book, I'm like, of course, this is not a disaster porn company. It's an education company. Like, who's going to argue against education? I kind of think I'm here to argue against education. Because, you know, I mean, as you say, at the end of this exhibit, they're like, you know, a bunch of survivors talking on a loop about how people need to love each other and all you need is love. And I'm like, you know, I have a PhD in Yiddish. I've read a lot of survivor literature in Yiddish. I've never read anybody talking about love. Doesn't come up. I mean, the Holocaust didn't happen because of a lack of love. It happened because entire societies abdicated responsibility for their problems. But like, instead, we have to like, turn it into this like, feel-good message. And that's what I mean when I say, you know, 
People tell stories about dead Jews that make them feel better about themselves because the other problem with Holocaust education is that, you know, you, in a sense, Holocaust education is one of those stories that makes people feel better about themselves because you, Hopefully, when you go to a museum or, or learn about this in school, like hopefully you feel bad about what happened, but you feel great about yourself because you're like, I would never do this. I'm like, yay, hooray for you. You would never industrially murder six million people. Like, go you. Like, we all look great compared to Nazis, right? Like, is that the bar? I mean, that now we have this like public ritual where like whenever some public figure says something vaguely anti-Semitic. We have to like drag them to a Holocaust museum and then they have to make some public statement where they're like Nazis are bad. Like that's kind of a low bar to clear. And the problem with this is that, you know, there's millions of Americans who think that anti-Semitism consists of murdering six million Jews. And anything short of that is kind of no big deal. And the other problem, I mean, there's a point where, you know, I have in the book where I'm like, here's a lot of things that aren't the Holocaust. And I mentioned everything from like trolling Jews on social media to expelling Jews from entire countries and seizing all their assets, which, you know, happened in many countries in the world. I'm like, look at all these things that aren't the Holocaust. And all of them kind of look like no big deal. And, you know, the other problem, what you mentioned is like when the debate about that museum, about, you know, whether it should be a museum about all genocides, I, I think. I don't know if this is really true, but it seems to me that the Holocaust is the only is the only historical event that is always universalized. Like when you go to the Museum of African American History, or you learn about American slavery, you don't get to the end of that exhibit and then see an exhibit about human sex trafficking. Right? Like, why would you do that? Like, oh look, here's another. Like, why? No, you get to the end of that exhibit, there's an exhibit about like the civil rights movement, right? Makes a lot more sense, because the other way only makes sense if you're turning the dead people into a symbol that you're using for some purpose rather than who they actually are. And then the other problem with this, I'm sorry, I'm like ranting here, but yeah, the, the other problem- That's why we brought you here. What? Yeah. Yes, to rant, here, here I am ranting. Um, I, nobody lets me rant in my house, so this is nice. Um, my children don't appreciate my rants. Yeah, if you get frustrated, let us know, we'll invite you back. Yeah, <laughs> so, so the thing is that, um, the other problem is that you go to those museums, and as I said, like, everybody knows the names of three concentration camps. Nobody knows the names of three Yiddish writers. Like, you really know absolutely nothing about the culture that was destroyed. And this is something I don't talk about in the, bo in the book, but I do talk about it in my podcast. The children's exhibit at the museum in Washington is called Daniel's Story. I don't know if people ever saw this or are familiar with this. It's like you walk into this house of this you know, German Jewish boy in Frankfurt. And it's like, you know, you see his soccer trophies on the wall, his dad was a war veteran, you see his dad's medals from the German army, and then, you know, whatever, the next room you go to, uh, you know, the ghetto or whatever. And what's interesting to me about that is like, why is there this German-speaking soccer-playing kid representing the children who died in the Holocaust? When, like I said, 85% of the people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers, a huge percentage of those people were from Jews. Like, why don't we have, like, why do we have this kid's soccer trophies? Why don't we have his copies of the Mishnah? Or why don't we have his scouting uniform from his Zionist youth group, right? Or, like, why do we have dad's war medals? Why don't we have dad's to fill in? Or why don't we have dad's tickets to the Yiddish theater? You know, I mean, like, the Nazi project was not just about murdering six million Jews. It was about destroying Jewish civilization. Why are we participating in that erasure? by perpetuating it. So I spent my entire rabbinic career being anti-anti-Semitism. That is turned off by the, the idea of Jewish identity that revolved around they're trying to kill us so we have to be Jews. And um, teaching that, that, that as your first number of books were all about, that Judaism is about joy and about content and celebration and, and all these things, and that's what you build an identity around. And yet, I find at the very end of my career, having to go back to anti-Semitism. It's a real drag, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible, right? I mean, well, but also, like, 
what I think is would be the problem is like is is this does happen in the Jewish world, right? Like, or what, there are people in the Jewish community whose identity is based, like you said, it's like this anti anti you know, it's like they're Jewish because people hate you or something. And you know, I, I'm. I feel sorry for those people that they're missing out on like the actual content of Jewish civilization. But what I also feel sad for is that like non-Jews are missing out on the actual content of Jewish civilization. Because if you think about, and you know, this is really what it comes down to is that, you know, what does it say in like a high school history textbook about Jews? If it's a book that has ancient history in it, you know, maybe there's a page about the Israelites, but you know, it doesn't tell you those people are Jews, right? That's a big secret. Um, and then if it's a book that has modern history, there's probably like a chapter near the end about the Holocaust. So we learn from this that Jews are people who got killed and their murders teach us some lesson about humanity, right? But there's nothing else. And this is, you know, think about what this really means because Jews are not like some like minor fringe group. Jews are fundamental to the history of the West. You can't understand Western civilization without understanding Judaism. We gave the world their most famous dead Jew. Yes, we sure did. We sure did. But like, I mean, it's not just that. We also gave the world the weekend. I mean, like, there's a lot of things, you know, I mean, I, there's a lot of things that we gave the world. And it's not just we gave the world, but also like, imagine if Jewish history were included in that textbook it would kind of undermine a lot of things that are in that textbook that people want to believe. So I'm gonna give a very tiny example of this that's not in the book, I do talk about it in the podcast. Tiny example, literacy. Think about what, what it says in that same textbook where you, know, you only meet Jews in a mass grave. What does it say about literacy in that book? It probably says something like, before the printing press, nobody knew how to read, you know, only the clergy and the nobles and the wealthy people knew how to read, and then there's the printing press, and then, you know, a few centuries later, there's industrial production, and then hooray, finally, you know, poor people can learn how to read. I mean, it's a nice story, but, like, it's a lie, because Jewish communities had, like, you know, widespread literacy thousands of years before the printing press. I mean, like, you know, poor kids in 12th, poor Jewish kids in 12th century Yemen learned how to read. Poor Jewish kids in 10th century Spain learned how to read. Poor Jewish kids everywhere learned how to read. And so, you know, if you think about, like, what would it mean if you put that story in the textbook? Well, that would undermine the other story, because it would reveal that, actually, you don't need advanced technology and, you know, mass industrial production for people to learn how to read. You just need a society that thinks that reading is important. So, I mean, that would change a lot of what you learned. So, I mean, it really would change the whole structure of how we studied if we were to, like, flip this narrative. Right. Yeah. Um, I just want to Sure. Yeah, so for people who maybe didn't hear on the Zoom, um, the question was about this new museum that recently opened in Hollywood, or, or uh, it's in Los Angeles that's about the history of Hollywood, and somehow they managed to create this entire museum about the history of Hollywood without mentioning the Jews who created Hollywood, um, which is kind of an Im impressive omission, and yes, now they are changing that. Um, you know, because they did get a lot of, a lot of criticism for that. Um, I think it's an example of this kind of erasure, right? I mean, it's very, it's very clear, clear uh, symbol of that erasure. What's really interesting is that, I mean, the reason Jews founded Hollywood was because they were shut out of other industries. I mean, the reason that Jews founded Hollywood is a product of American anti-Semitism, because these were writers who couldn't get a job in traditional publishing or in journalism or in advertising, and this is, was like a new industry that was open. So, I mean, it very much illustrates that, but I think that that sort of, that erasure is like something that American Jews are like so used to. 
Um, there was an article about this. Um, the, there was an article in the New York Times about, uh, about a month ago called Is It Funny for the Jews? that was about Jewish comedy. And he, um, the author quotes my book uh, quite a few times, but the reason I mention it is because you know, he mentions something similar about Hollywood where, and it's actually from um, Jeremy Dauber who teaches um, Yiddish at Columbia. He had a book about Jews in, on TV. And he points out that there was like a whole period from like, I forget the years, but it's like 1975 to like 1990. And he tracks that basically there are no Jewish characters on primetime TV. And you're like, well, Jews are running Hollywood. Yeah, but they know their audience. Yeah. And then he also tracked that even after you have like Seinfeld and the nanny or whatever, there are no Jewish couples on TV. No Jewish couples. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's a, a, an erasure here, and absolutely. Yeah. Sorry? Mazel is not Jewish. Oh, well, well that's a different, a different problem. So someone said Mrs. Mazel was not Jewish. Yeah, that's like a sort of a whole different conversation about like all these non-Jewish actors who are playing Jewish characters. Yeah, that's been debated a lot in the press. So. Um, do you think that Waterford is trying to steal some sort of So the question is about you know this that there's so much emphasis on Holocaust education that's the only thing people know about and then there's also it's not just an erasure of Jewish history it's an erasure of the history of anti-Semitism. Um, yes, absolutely, and and particularly like you have a total erasure of the history of Jews in the Middle East, um, you know, and and sort of you know long you know thousands of years Jewish of Jewish history in the Middle East that's erased. Um, absolutely, and you know I think that you know like if you think about like people. Who, this is the only thing they learned in school, and they really think that this is, this is it. Like, I actually had, um, I did an event with a, a Jewish organization that does a lot of like intergroup, interfaith kind of work, and this woman running this event told me that she was talking with her counterpart at a black organization, and this woman said to her, you know, the thing about anti-Semitism is that it's like, you have the Holocaust, which is terrible, and it's like, one and done. And she's like, I didn't even know how to begin to answer this, to, to, to respond to this. But like, you know, it's not that that person is like malicious or bigoted. That person is saying what they learned in school. That's literally what you learned in public school. Like, there's no context. That's, and the way the Holocaust is taught, where it's like this event outside of history, where it's like this theological question, where it was God. It's like, no, the Yiddish word for the Holocaust is chorban which is Horban, like the Horban Beit HaMikdash, like the destruction of the temple. It's seen as a continuity. And absolutely, the history, the erasure of Jews, of you know, Middle Eastern Jews and Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews is like hugely problematic. Um, I had a uh, person at one of my events who told me that um, her daughter's a college student. This was a woman who is a uh, Moroccan Jew. She and her husband were both Moroccan Jews. Her daughter was born here. Um, she said her daughter was at a, at a college seminar and sitting next to, in the seminar room, another student, same parents are from Morocco, but not Jewish. The professor literally says to her daughter, is like, well, you're white, so you're not, you know, so you're, no one's discriminated against you. This guy is a person of color. They're literally both from Morocco. And so you just see there's, there is, and you know, the, what I want, part of the long history of anti-Semitism is the erasure of Jews and it's not just the erasure of Jews, it's telling Jews that they're not who they say they are, right? I mean, and, and also claiming that you are what the Jews, like this goes back to like history of the church, like, oh, we're the real Israel. 
You know, like, oh, the, those, they're, you know, the Jews are the imposters, and they're, we're the real Israel. I'm like, there's a lot of, um, there's a book by a uh, historian, David Nirenberg, called Anti-Judaism, the Western tradition, where he talks about the history of, uh, basically, it's the history of anti-Semitism. He goes back to the ancient world. It's like before Christianity, before Islam. But he, what he basically says is there's a lot of these non-Jewish societies defined themselves against Judaism. Like, whatever, like, we're what's not Jewish. And he traces that from, like, the ancient world all the way to, like, the Enlightenment and past it. So we're up against a lot of things here. And, and I think the, the, but the good news is a lot of people who are saying these things are not saying it because they're malicious. They're saying it because they don't know. They don't know. And the other good news is that I think that we really can change this story. And the reason I think this is because you look at the success of the Jewish community in creating Holocaust education. Like, we achieved that, right? We managed to get that into the curricula of, like, I don't know how many states, right? That was, that was an achievement of the Jewish community. I think we can continue that, in a sense, and build something. There's, there's ways that we can educate the public in a way that is a little different from what we've done in the past. Oh, the question was how. <laughs> That's a very big question for me to answer at the last minute. I mean, you know, I think it starts just with, you know, people don't know these things. Um, you know, that's what I've discovered most in this book is like, you know, and, and even as you said, it's like, I never heard of the history of Harbin. Okay, that's a little obscure. Um, but, you know, there, there are a lot of people who just, were, you're, people are starting from nothing, right? People are really, and even, you know, Jews who don't, Jews who went to public school and don't have any other Jewish education are getting the same education as non-Jews. They also only know about the Holocaust, right? So, I mean, there are ways that we can change this curriculum um, in schools, there are ways that we can broaden, I mean, so the question about how, I think there's like, you know, that's a very long answer, but there's, there's like, there's different ways of affecting a culture. And through things like education, through things like the arts, writing books, making TV shows, um, you know, there are ways that you can kind of change the conversation. And that, that is one thing that, that the Jewish community actually has been pretty good at in the past is changing the conversation. Okay, Ellen Walk here. The bad news is that I'm going to have to go home and tell Paul that it wasn't changed from Volop to Walk at Ellis Island. <laughs> <laughs> what a special evening. It was our good fortune to have you, Dr. Horn, as our inaugural speaker for the Alan B. Lucas Lecture Series. Your inspiring words and your animated discussion with our Rabbi Lucas exceeded our greatest expectation. The topic of tonight's um, presentation is emotionally difficult for all of us, but your words have helped us develop a deeper understanding of the world in which we live. And this program, which we hope will be the first among many, has been a, a fitting tribute to Rabbi Lucas's commitment to lifelong learning. So on behalf of all of us, I thank you both, Dr. Horn and Rabbi Lucas, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us tonight. We also give heartfelt thanks to Wendy Yeager Hyman and each member of the Alan B. Lucas Inaugural Lecture Series Committee. This exceptional evening is the result of your creativity and hard work. And Wendy, somehow you always manage to make it look easy. Um, I am the privileged, I'm privileged to be a co-chair with Carolyn Canova of the um, with Carolyn Canova of the committee charged with organizing a series of farewell events to honor Rabbi Lucas, and tonight was the first. In the months ahead, there are many opportunities to celebrate with Rabbi Lucas Biyachad together to thank him for his contribution to our lives and recognize all that he means to us. On Sunday morning, May, uh, May 15th, the religious school will be presenting a musical salute to Rabbi Lucas in their Zimriyah, that same afternoon, we'll be taking our favorite Mets fan out to the ball game at City Field. We'll be posting details on our TBS website shortly, and please look for formal invitations, which will be going out soon for the Grand Farewell Weekend. Be sure to save the dates, June 10th through 12th. 
On that Friday night, there'll be a Kabbalat Shabbat barbecue, Shabbat morning after services, a special L'chaim Kiddush, and finally, a grand farewell celebration on Sunday evening. We are very excited and a little verklempt to present these wonderful events to express our love and appreciation to our rabbi, and we hope you'll join us. Thank you all for being here tonight, here and on live stream. On behalf of our committee, I trust that you enjoyed this evening as much as we did. I invite you now to join us in the lobby for book signing, coffee, tea, and cookies. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what are you working on now? What am I working on? So yeah, I mean, um, a few things. Um, probably walk this yeah.